Chapter 169 The War Autumn and Winter 1980 Wednesday, the 3rd of September, 1980. Whoosh! Splash! Remus landed on his feet, just about, right in a muddy puddle in the middle of the high street. Bugger! He muttered, yanking his clothes cup out of the way. His boots were beyond saving, socks already soaked through. He hadn't realised the holes were that bad. It was definitely time for a new pair. He'd need to check his savings. It looked like it might rain later, too. Bloody perfect! Remus was in a very bad mood, and wet feet were the least of it. Still, he was in Hogsmeade for a reason, and he knew he just had to pull his metaphorical socks up and get on with it. He wished he wasn't alone, but even if someone had been available to come with him. James had the baby, Lily and Sirius were in broad stairs on reconnaissance, Marlene, Peter and Mary were all working. He'd been told to come alone, as usual. He trudged towards the three broomsticks, thinking at least there would be a nice warm fire and maybe a nip of whiskey waiting for him. He'd need it. Whenever he was summoned to meet someone alone, it was usually werewolf business, and that always required a stiff drink. He hoped it was news of Greyback rather than Castor. It began to spit rain as he came within sight of the pub, and he jogged a bit to save the rest of his clothes from damp. It was a quiet afternoon in the little Scottish village, The students of Hogwarts would be in their lesson, the wizards who lived in town would be at their occupations, and very few people left the house these days, if they didn't have to. The pub was nice and empty. Remus felt a stab of nostalgia as he entered, remembering how only two short years ago he and his friends had all sat in one of these booths, bright-eyed and naive, looking forward to their futures. Who could have known that saving the world would be such a grey, monotonous slog? Remus Lupin, as I live and breathe, was Myrta Chirp from the bar, one hand on her round hip, bosom overflowing as usual. She glanced hopefully over his shoulder. Black not joining you? Remus shook his head and went to take the seat near the hearth, so that he could at least try and dry out his shoes. Not today, Rosmerta, he said, trying to affect a good cheer. Could I get a glass of two glasses of butterbeer, please? A familiar voice intoned. Remus whipped around, finding himself face to face with Dumbledore. Oh, uh, hello, Professor, Remus said, embarrassed. Remus. Dumbledore nodded politely. He never called him Mr. Lupin, not since Remus had asked him not to, years ago. Please be seated, he gestured grandly, like a vicar about to give a sermon. Remus sat. Dumbledore always made him feel eleven years old. "'How have you been?' his old headmaster asked kindly, gracefully taking the armchair opposite. He set down a heavy-looking leather briefcase on the rug between them. Remus eyed it warily, but answered. "'Well, thanks. Well, you know. "'These are difficult times,' Dumbledore said, and Remus didn't respond to that, because he wasn't sure he was supposed to. Rosmerta bustled over with the butter beers, setting them down on the little round side table. When she'd left, Remus lifted his tank tard and drank, just for a distraction. He could pretend it was alcohol, maybe that would steady him. He desperately wanted a cigarette, but for some reason that felt wrong in front of Dumbledore, so he just sipped the butter beer, feeling the cloyey syrupy mixture rest on his tongue and slide down his throat. You must be wondering why I asked you here. Dumbledore said, watching him. Is it... is it... Greyback? Remus whispered. Dumbledore smiled. You needn't worry about eavesdroppers, Remus. We are quite safe to speak freely here. No, 
Alas, there have been no further reports of Greyback or the young lady he is travelling with. Oh, Rims blinked. Well then what? This is a rather more pressing matter, or at least it will be if I am correct. Right. Rima shifted uncomfortably. He was not usually the go-to agent when it came to pressing matters. Dumbledore seemed to read his mind. I am in need of someone with a keen eye for detail and a good deal of patience. He leaned forward and opened the briefcase. Remus peered inside. Books, he said, surprised. There must be a hundred of them inside, some sort of extension charm, perhaps. Indeed. Dumbledore smiled, closing the briefcase again. So, you need some research done? I do indeed. Tell me, Remus, how much do you know about prophecy? Um, well, I never took divination. He scratched his head. He was intrigued now. But obviously it comes up a bit in runes. I've read a bit. You will need to read a lot more, Dumbledore said gravely. And I must insist upon you both the importance of this task and the sensitivity. Anything you learn must be kept entirely confidential. Do you understand? I... of course... Remus nodded, slightly alarmed. But what do you want me to look for? For now, we are simply seeking a fuller understanding of the nature of prophecy. Many of these books contain secret transcripts, some of which may need translating, of known prophetic and oracular statements. Um, I should like to know if there are any which appear to relate to Voldemort, or to this particular moment in history. So, you think someone might have already made a prophecy about how the war ends? They may have, the professor replied shortly. But we cannot afford to make any rash decisions. While there is still time, I would like to know as much as we can. Dumbledore switched between I and we regularly when he spoke about the war, Remus noticed. Still, he thought he pretty much understood. Okay, he said. How shall I let you know if I find anything? I shall come to you, Dumbledore replied cryptically. Once again, Remus. I cannot overstate the importance of this task. You must tell nobody. Understood? Understood. That meant not telling Sirius, or James, or any one of his friends. Sometimes Remus wondered if secrets were simply his lot in life. He thought for a moment. Professor? Yes. Should I keep an eye out for prophecies that have been prevented, or... He rephrased, because he knew that was impossible. Circumvented. I mean, I don't know loads about it, but there are always loopholes, aren't there? Dumbledore's eyes glittered, and a small smile played on his lips. Very good, Remus. Friday the 24th of October, 1980. And that was how Remus spent much of his autumn. He studied well into October. It wasn't bad at all, actually. He enjoyed it. He'd always liked research, and though he missed the peaceful airy chambers of Hogwarts Library, he was pretty content squirrelled away in the little London flat, with endless pots of tea and a quiet smoking ashtray on his hand. If Sirius came in, he would cast obstigate over his notes and books, and Sirius seemed happy with this arrangement. He understood what needed to be done in the service of the war. Anyway, they were barely at the flat, Remus only used it to work in. They spent much more of their time at the Potter's Mansion, where James's old bedroom had been turned into a nursery. But Sirius's old room was the same as ever, only with half of Remus's things in it too. 
Together, the Marauders and Lily had grown into a funny little family, with baby Harry at the centre. It took Remus a month or so to really get over his fear of infants, and it still made him a bit anxious to actually hold Harry, but Sirius had been a huge help. Sirius was utterly besotted with his godson. The child was barely ever out of his arms when they were visiting, a relief for Lily and James, who were only just bearing up under the pressure of parenthood combined with their duties for the order. Say Padfoot. Harry, go on. Pad. Foot. Sirius cooed one evening as he bounced the tiny little green-eyed creature on his lap. They don't talk until they're at least one, Remus smirked, sitting gingerly on the arm of the couch. I looked it up. Normal kids don't. Sirius tossed his hair back, gently holding Harry's chubby little wrists. But Harry Potter is no ordinary baby. He's clearly very advanced for his age. Come on, Harry. Say, pad, foot. (laughs) Don't get your hopes up, Lily laughed. James's mum told me he didn't speak until at least 18 months. Oi, James yelled from his father's study. I was an extremely thoughtful child, that's all. (laughs) Oh yeah, what changed? Sirius yelled back, grinning. You're hogging him, Padfoot, Peter whined, reaching his arms out. Come on, I haven't had a cuddle yet. Not my fault he likes me best, Sirius replied, poking out his tongue at Peter, and then at Harry, puffing out his cheeks and bulging his eyes so that the baby giggled and burbled contently. I'll give you a cuddle, Pete, Remus teased. Lily, tell him, Peter tutted, folding his arms crossly. Honestly, I've got one son and that's plenty, Lily laughed, getting up. No fighting while Mummy and Daddy are out, okay, boys? She gave them all a very stern look. You've been spending too much time with Molly, Sirius said. Right, I'm ready. James came back through the living room with his travelling cloak. Lily already had hers on. She gave him a stoic smile. Let's go then. A cold silence entered the room, and Remus looked at the floor because he couldn't bring himself to look at any of his friends, and especially not the baby. Lily broke it. Oh, stop being so melodramatic, you lot. It's a standard mission. We've done a hundred of these. She went over to Sirius and bent to kiss Harry's head, already sprouting a thatch of fine black hair. Bye-bye, Harry. Mummy and Daddy love you so much. We'll see you soon. James didn't say goodbye. He had a wooden, muted expression that Remus had been seeing more and more of since his parents' funeral. Are you sure? You, You can't tell us where... Pete started. Sorry, Wormy. James held up his hands. Moody's orders. You know how it is. Peter nodded, shoulders slumping. Remus knew how he felt. It was difficult enough knowing that your friends were walking into danger. It was even harder not knowing exactly what they would be facing, as though they were disappearing out of reach. Come on! Lily hurried her husband, pulling him from the room. Back before morning, we hope, she called from the hallway. And then the door slammed, and Harry burst into tears. Oh, bugger, Sirius said over the screams. Ah, have him now if you like, Pete. It took hours to finally calm Harry down. He bawled as if his heart was broken and wouldn't settle until it was nearly midnight. (gasps) Definitely couldn't do this full time, Sirius said, head in his hands as he slumped on the floor in the nursery. Jesus, I swear the kid's possessed, Remus whispered, rubbing his temples. He had a splitting headache. Shit, you should go to bed, Sirius said, looking up at him. His usually immaculately silky black hair was in knots, and there was definitely some milky baby sick stuck in there. Without a trace of irony, he frowned at Remus. You must be exhausted. Oh, I'm fine, Remus shrugged. He tried not to wince as he felt every tendon in his back tug. Yesterday had been the full moon. Actually, I wasn't going to stay. You know, I've got that work to do. Oh, that. Sirius nodded, 
His mouth was a straight line. He climbed to his feet, glancing at the red and gold cot one last time. Harry was sleeping, thank God. They both padded quietly out of the room, leaving it open just a crack. On the landing, where the lights were still on, Sirius looked even worse. He had rings under his eyes, which were bloodshot. Remus touched his arm gently. You ought to go to bed. Sirius grabbed his arm suddenly, eyes widening. Mooney, don't go. Huh? I'm only going to the flat. Please. Sirius clutched at him, half mad with tiredness. Just take the night off. Just stay here with me. Pete's here. Remus turned his head slightly. He could hear Peter snoring in the couch downstairs. Not much comfort, he supposed. But I want you, Sirius said desperately. That struck Remus in an unusual way. To anyone else, it might have sounded whinging, childish. After all, Sirius was a grown man, and Remus had important work to do. But somehow, it dislodged a feeling Remus hadn't had for Sirius in a long time. A desire to protect him. To hold him close and tell him everything was going to be okay. And to be strong and reliable for the man he loved. Amazed by this revelation, Remus did exactly that hugging Sirius tightly and kissing his filthy hair. Okay then, he whispered. I'll stay. After all, he thought, as Sirius trailed off to have a shower, relief evident in his posture. Wouldn't Sirius do the same for him? Friday the 21st of November, 1980. That time, Lily and James came back, as always, tired, a little harder, a little less bright, but otherwise perfectly okay. Remus always felt enormous relief when any of his friends returned safely, and each time swore to himself that he would not take it for granted. But what does that mean, when you're young? There had been deaths, deaths in the order, deaths of people he knew, but no one really close, no one he truly loved. The Pruitts he'd been fond of, Benji Fenwick he had chatted to once or twice, but they weren't close, and their losses didn't affect him severely. Compared to others... Remus had been extremely lucky. Of course, you never feel lucky at the time. Good fortune is too often something that can only be recognised with hindsight. Sirius turned 21 in November. They didn't have a party, but Hagrid baked a rather wonky, though very large and very delicious cake, which they all ate at the Order House, after the regular meeting. Someone took a few photos, but Remus forgot to try and track them down. It's a big deal for muggles, 21, he commented as they climbed into bed that evening. That's when they come of age. Why? Muggles can't do magic, Sirius frowned, yawning. No, no, it's it's an old-fashioned thing, Miris tried to explain. You get the key to your front door or something like that. Daft muggles, Sirius grumbled, his eyes already closing. I feel old. Well, you're not. Remus settled down beside him. I'm the one going grey. Twenty-one is young. It's really, really young. Sirius sighed warily. Doesn't feel it. Remus knew exactly what he meant, but he didn't like it. They were all of them caught in a confusing place between adolescence and adulthood. Baby Harry had only exacerbated that. There was a sense of time running out, of needing to accomplish as much as possible as fast as possible. Peter's crawling at his ministry job, always angling for a better position, James and Lily playing house and soldiers at the same time, and Remus and his stupid drinking. At least he had the research to do, and that seemed to be going well. Every now and then Dumbledore dropped by to see how he was getting on, and Remus would offload as much information as he could, with detail, because he knew Dumbledore liked detail. The old man would nod sagely, stroke his beard, and sit quietly, ruminating. If he came to any conclusions, he didn't tell Remus. It felt good, though. Remus even felt himself warming to Dumbledore for the first time. He liked being useful. And then, just before the November full moon, Remus got his chance to be really useful. As usual, there was a message from Moody, He was to apparate to some very specific coordinates on Friday the 21st of November and meet Firox there. 
Tell him no, Sirius said, annoyed. Bloody moody. He knows that it's the night before the full moon. You shouldn't be out running his errands when you're not well. Jesus, you make me sound like an invalid. Remus rolled his eyes. I'm sure there's a good reason for it. I'll be fine, don't worry. Hmm. Send a Patronus, if anything happens. Sirius asked, solemnly. I don't care about protocol. Just say you'll let me know. It'll be fine, Remus repeated. He really did feel fine about it. When a moon was waxing, he often felt stronger than usual, and usually didn't get bouts of nausea until a few hours before sunset. It was good to get out of London, away from traffic and noise and crowds. It was good to get away from the potters, from nappies and baby talk and crying and creamed spinach. At the time agreed, Remus apparated following the instructions he'd been given, and found himself on a windy cliff top, somewhere very cold and bleak. The sea crashed and raged miles below, and the long grass whipped around his ankles. Remus breathed in deeply, inhaling the salt, the soil, the sharp, cold scent of the clouds. The wolf inside him licked his lips, ears prickling to attention. Yes, Greyback had been here. Hello! Ferox was away off in the distance, a stick figure man waving at him. Remus raised a palm in greeting bent forward into the wind and trudged to meet him. (sighs) Hi, he said, breathless as he approached, cold hands deep in his pockets, nose frozen. Where are we? Galloway, Ferox said cheerfully. He had a thick leather cloak on, with a hood, but his face was still ruddy from the harsh weather, and white fog blew from his lips as he spoke. Pretty, isn't it? Remus wasn't sure if he was being sarcastic or not, so he just gave a neutral smile. Privately, he thought that yes, the landscape was beautiful, if for biding. Greyback's been here, he said, wanting to get down to it. You know for sure? One hundred percent, Remus nodded. Felix nodded too. Excellent. We were right then. There was a report to the Muggle police about a couple of tramps, man and a woman, Looking shifty. Reckon they've been here then? Remus considered, breathing in again. Yeah, but the scent's old. Maybe a day or so. Right. Shall we take a walk then? See if it gets a bit stronger. Okay. Remus wasn't sure how he felt, being the Order's bloodhound. But he wanted to find Grey back as much as anyone, so he did as he was told. They strolled up and down the cliff top for a while, until Remus could be sure which way the trail led. As they headed downhill, away from the sea and down towards a small country road, he grew confident that Livia and Greyback had been there very recently, and began to walk faster. Furox had no trouble keeping up, of course. He was as fit and healthy as he'd ever been. What will we do, if we find him? Remus asked as they walked. He was careful not to bring Livia into it. Because, okay, while she was definitely a killer, he couldn't help feeling a bit more sympathetic towards her. After all, she was his sister, in a warped kind of way. Moody reckons they'll be hunkered down somewhere for the full moon, Felix replied. Based on my research, werewolves are weakest right after the moon, so we'll wait until then. Your research? Remus gave him a funny look. Few books are picked up. There's not a lot to go on, beyond the newt-level stuff. Have you spoken to Madame Pomfrey? She looked after me for seven years. She knows loads, Remus said, trying not to sound too impatient. Or Marlene McKinnon? She's been constructing her own case studies to see if any advances can be made in lycanthropy treatment. Or, you know, you could ask me. I might know a bit. Ferox laughed good-naturedly. All right, lad, all right. I see what you're saying. It's just there isn't always time to follow umpteen leads on a prick like Greyback. Got to move fast. Rima said nothing, because it would only have come out wrong. He really hated criticising Ferox. It felt so awkward and embarrassing. He'd looked up to him as an ideal version of manhood once, 
and he didn't like tampering on that illusion too much. But honestly, the way he talked, you'd think Greyback was just some petty criminal, not a murderous creature and a charismatic cult leader. The scent had grown very strong now, and as they crested the next hill, rumours could make out a large grey-black structure in the distance. The ruins of an old castle. Scotland was littered with them, of course. This one was a tower house, and looked like a big square prison squatting ominously on the remains of a boggy moat. There, rumours said, stopping short. That's where he'll be. Ferox clapped him on the shoulder. Good work, lad. Saturday the 22nd of November. Ferox didn't want Remus present for the confrontation with Greyback. Remus did not give a toss. He knew where to go and when, and nothing would change his mind. I'm coming too, then, Sirius said firmly, after he'd wheedled enough information out of Remus. No, you're bloody not, Remus said. Am too. Sorry, Mooney, but there is absolutely no way I'm losing you to that monster a second time. You didn't lose me last time, you big drama queen. It was a mission, Remus countered. Anyway, I can't put you in that sort of danger. I'm in danger every day, Sirius shrugged. If it's right after the full moon, you'll need my help apparating. I've done that before, Remus dismissed. It's hard but I'll manage. Anyway, this isn't a normal mission. You wouldn't just be back up. You'd be leverage against me. He knows who you are. He knows what you mean to me. He made you tell him? Sort of. What well, I told you they can read minds. <gasps> that bastard. Well, I'm definitely coming with you. Remus had forgotten how strongly Sirius felt about legimency. Walpurga had used it as a punishment, and he would forever associate mind-reading with black magic. Remus hadn't raised the fact that this appeared to be a werewolf trait, and that, when pushed, he could do it too. Probably not a good idea to mention that just yet, he decided. So Sirius got his way, of course, and Remus just hoped he would be able to protect him. They went to the Lake District for the full moon, a place the marauders had enjoyed themselves before, a place with happy memories. James and Peter didn't go. James hadn't joined them for a full moon since Harry was born, and Remus understood that he didn't want to be away from his family too often. Peter said something vague about working late, and honestly Remus was too busy worrying about the upcoming battle with Greyback to question it. The wolf probably had a good time that night, but Remus didn't remember much about it. It all got lost in the blood-red haze of transformation, the choking and clawing and groaning as he twisted back into his human form. Oh, I've got you, Mooney. Sirius had him by the shoulders, pulling a cloak across his body. Remus forced his eyes open, knowing how little time there was. Wand, he croaked, getting up. Sirius handed it to him. We've got to go now, Remus said, leaning on Sirius for support while he pulled his clothes on hand-shaking and fumbling with the buttons on his shirt and trousers. "'We're going. Just take a breath,' Sirius said, his voice calm and firm. "'Hold on to me. I'll apparate us.' Sirius was as good as his word. He didn't try to dissuade Remus from going, or try to tell him what to do. He simply got them there, where they needed to be. Ferox was there already. "'All right, lads,' he nodded keeping his voice low. It was still quite dark under the grey Galloway sky, and the grasslands were cloaked in swathy, gauzy mist, the castle ruin rising from it, black and foreboding. It was quiet, no birdsong, no noise at all, like a place out of time. Have you seen anything? Remus asked desperately. He could smell them, the scent was very strong. Heard a bit of noise. Must have been them turning back, Furok said. He gave Remus a look. Y- you okay, our kid? Looking a bit green about the gills. I'm fine, Remus swallowed. Fine. We should go in now. Right you are. One's out. Furok straightened up and started forward. 
Pity we couldn't get them when they were werewolves, he said with a smirk. Those pelt fetch a few bob on the black market. Remus felt sick and the sweat on his back turned cold. Sirius reached for his hand in the dark and gave it a squeeze, then tossed his head and said sharply, Don't say shit like that. It's disgusting. Ferox glanced back at him, shocked, then at Remus. He frowned. Sorry, lad. Didn't mean anything by it. They didn't say another word as they approached the castle. Sirius and Ferox were trying to be quiet, but Remus knew they may as well have been a herd of elephants sneaking up on Livia and Greyback, whose senses were just as sharp as his, even after a full moon. Still, they might be slower, weaker. When they were up against the castle wall, Remus felt it. Greyback was waiting. The scent changed, and his head was filled with that dreadful growling voice. Hello, cub. Brought me breakfast, have you? He knows we're here, Remus whispered frantically. Be careful. Ferox touched his brow in a sort of salute to show that he understood. Then he rounded the corner and entered, Remus hurrying behind, and Sirius too. Ferox had his wand raised, and as he stepped under the broken archway in the shadows of the ruin, he opened his mouth. He had planned to use the silver chain spell to bind the werewolves and contain them long enough for the auras to take over. But it was too late. Remus was only a split second behind Ferox, and saw the rock come down. He stiffened, then crumpled to the ground, blood oozing from a cut at the crown of his head. No! Remus cried, over Greyback's laughter, as the beast of a man stepped into the early morning light, his face full of glee. Olivia sprung out next, and lunged at Sirius, grabbing his wand and knocking him to the ground. Ooh! Who's this then, brother? Pretty, pretty boy! She crowed, sitting astride him, holding both of Sirius's wrist over his head as he struggled. She looked thinner, but was obviously as strong as ever. Let him go, Remus snarled, raising his wand, furious. Then he screamed in agony. Greyback grabbed his wand arm and twisted it so hard he felt the bone snap. Remus! Sirius called out. Remus was almost blind with pain, and Greyback laughed again, letting him go. Welcome back, cub, he purred. How I've missed you. Fuck you, Remus groaned, staring about for his wand, which he'd dropped somewhere. Now, now, Greyback chuckled as Remus straightened up to face him, clutching his broken arm to his chest. You should be on your hands and knees after what you did to me. Kill him, father, Livia cackled. Kill the traitor Remus Lupin, just as he killed my brother Gaius. Then I can have the pretty one. Greyback grinned at her fondly. She's full of bright ideas, my beautiful girl. Remus took the opportunity to look over Greyback's shoulder. Ferox was moving, very slowly. He was obviously hurt, but Remus saw his fist tighten around his wand. Go on then, Remus said to Greyback, gritting his teeth through the pain. Kill me. Then what? Then what? Greyback sneered. Then I rip apart your little human pet, that's what. Then I tear him limb from fucking limb, but not before I've had my fun with him. You're disgusting, Remus shot back, stalling for time as Ferox's eyes opened. May as well tell Greyback what he thought of him while he had the chance. You're filth, you're nothing. You talk about freedom, but you don't have the first clue what it is. You're nothing but a bully, Voldemort's lapdog. Kill him! Livia shrieked. Greyback's face had turned demonic with rage, yellow eyes glowing, and Remus really thought that would be the end. He scrunched his eyes and braced himself. What? Ah! Livia cried out again, and Remus heard a dog bark. He opened his eyes to see Livia knocked backwards by Padfoot, who was growling. 
Remus had never seen him growl before. Teeth bared, frothing at the mouth. Father! Livia yelped. Help me! And with a flash of purple light, Livia was silent. Her eyes went wide, and a great black slash had cut her throat. She clutched at her neck to stem the gushing blood, but it was no good. It was too late. Greyback gave a great roar of anguish, but Ferox was already on his feet, wand up, ready to cast the same curse again. Greyback was cornered. You're a dead man, he hissed at Ferox, and then, with one final snarl, he disapparated. Bugger, Ferox grunted, stumbling forward, still poised to curse. Sirius was serious again, and stood beside Livia, staring down at her. Remus went over too, feeling an uncomfortable mix of relief and genuine sorrow. Her grey fur cloak was matted with blood, which looked deep purple in the dim light. It was dreadful, but his first concern was for Sirius. Okay? he asked quietly. Sirius nodded, still looking down. You? think so. His arm was throbbing, sending shooting pains up into his shoulder, but he knew that could be fixed. Livia could not. Ferox joined them, a hand pressed to his head where the rock had struck him. Merlin, what a mess, he muttered. At least we got the bitch. Her name's Livia, Remus said angrily, and suddenly he saw the scene as a passerby might, three men standing over her tiny body. She could have ripped each of their throats out the night before without stopping for breath. She was a force of nature, queen of the night. She was one of the strongest people he had ever met. She was one of the only people in the world who truly understood what it meant to be a wolf. Her eyes were still open, staring blindly at the broad grey sky. Remus knelt beside her and gently closed them. End of chapter 169